You were created to know and enjoy God. You were called to be in community so that you can become all that God desires you to be. God designed you with a purpose so you can be the difference in this world. And we exist to help you on that journey, Graceway. Hi, welcome to Graceway Online. My name is Juliet, and I'm so glad that you're here. If you're watching on your TV or computer, be sure to go to graceway.app on your smartphone to take notes and learn more about what's happening at Graceway. We have a great service plan for today, so let's get started.
continue to worship. God, we honor you today. We love you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Come on, church, let's sing this out. I'm praying, God, come and turn this thing around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. Come on, sing it. It's all good. church let's make some noise let's show some love to our first time guests come on down ushers we're going to invite you guys to take tithes and offerings i want to remind you to just give with a grateful heart man when we give we are reminding ourselves that we're not a part of any economy but god's economy amen well we're going to sing king of kings as we take offering let's keep worshiping all right Stop. 
Jesus. together. God, we love you. God, we're clear that we loved you because you loved us first. God, I thank you for this church, 81 years of your faithfulness. Lord, I thank you for those baptisms today, watching couples get baptized together. Lord, the youngest that we're going to baptize today is six, the oldest is 80. Lord, we're grateful. Lord, we're grateful for what you're doing at Graceway Crossroads Correctional Facility. 250 men, 10 of them gave their lives to you. Lord, we're thankful that you're recreating a people out of this humble place, out of this brick and mortar. Lord, you don't have to show your goodness to us. You don't have to show your kindness to us. You don't have to give thought and intent and purpose to us, but you do in your grace, Lord, and we're grateful. Lord, I thank you for those who were baptized, for those who are going to get baptized. Lord, I thank you for every person in front of me, for everyone watching online. Lord, I thank you that they are loved by you today. I thank you, Lord, that you have thoughts and intents, plans and purposes for them. Lord, I pray that they would feel it and receive it today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us in a powerful way, Lord, we need it. Would you speak to us today, Lord? Would you bless us today? Lord, would you challenge us today? Would you continue this work that you began on the cross of recreating us to look more like Jesus? Lord, we humble ourselves before you. We surrender ourselves before you, Lord. We lay ourselves down and we say, Lord, let your kingdom come and your will be done in us today. 
Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your love. Thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for freedom. Thank you for new beginnings and second chances. Thank you that you see us, you know us, you love us. We honor you today. We praise you today. And in Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. Hey, dab someone up and then grab your seat if you would. Hey, let me talk to you today. If you have not been baptized, if you have not been baptized, we have another, I think, 15 people who are going to be getting baptized in the second service. We're excited about that. But let me talk to you if you have not been baptized. Some of y'all have been saved for a long time. You've never gone public with your faith. I just want to encourage you that today ought to be the day. You say, I'm not prepared. We're prepared. All right. We got trunks for you, we got drawers for you, we got underwear for you, we got hair stuff for those of you who are inflicted with hair unlike me, come on somebody, all right? Hey, if you want to get baptized, seriously, right now, go out to the next steps desk, say I want to get baptized, we'll baptize you either in the second service or after the second service. I promise you, you aren't going to be the only one we're excited for what God's doing here today. What a sweet thing. I said in my prayer, uh, but I want to say it again. What's up, Graceway Crossroads Correctional Facility? We love you, man. We love you. Thank you for being a part of us. And I just want to say this to you. This isn't some ministry that we have out there in Cameron, Missouri. This is us. Y'all are us. You're a part of our church, man. We're grateful to have you. Last week, we had 250 men. Ten of them gave their life to Jesus. We're excited about that. What a trip. We also found out that a bunch of the men didn't know that it was a church, thought it was a concert. Said, I ain't going to a Christian concert, right? And they were like, no, it's a church. What? It's a church? Oh, I'm going to church. So they're expecting another 50, 75, 100 men, and, uh, and God's doing a cool thing. We were on the front page of the Cameron, Missouri newspaper. Come on, I'm famous, all right? <laughs> I made it. I made it. I'm on the newspaper. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. We're excited. Fellas, hey, welcome. We love y'all. We love y'all. We believe in what God's doing in your lives. And uh, man, we're thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be a part. Let me say a quick prayer so we're dialed in right here and then we'll get to it. God, we love you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for laughter. Thank you for joy. Thank you for gratitude, Lord. You are worthy of all of it. Speak to us now uh, through your Holy Spirit. Bless us. Challenge us. Make us look more like Jesus. We thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, what do you see when you, uh, when you look in the mirror? Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that most of us, if we were honest, we would say, I, I don't like when I see, when I, when I look in the mirror. We, we see what we aren't when we look in the mirror. Uh, I, I see the blemish on my face or the lack of hair or the extra inches on the waist. I, I see what I ought to be and what I'm not. Our brains are hardwired for problems. The problem is that 11% of girls would use the word beautiful to describe themselves. 70% of adults say they do not have a significant figure in their life who believes in them. Never have. 85% of Americans suffer from what we call low self-esteem. You put on top of those things trauma, generational sin, bad decisions, regret. We, we have a problem. Unless you're in the top 15% of the self-actualized individuals living in perpetual states of bliss, enlightenment, and nirvana, you are like me prone to struggle with bouts of low self-worth, prone to have my confidence shaken. It's the reason, if I can just tell you, it's the reason that a lot of you, whenever you come to church, you feel guilty because you walked in with it. And then I talk about it. You're like, bro, I already know why you got to be putting me on blast. But you walk out not realizing that you walked in, you walked in with it. And here's my concern. I, I want to be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I'm feeling some weight today around what we need to talk about, because I think this is such an important thing, but it's such a small shift that I'm going to ask you to make that I'm afraid that you're going to miss it. So I want you to do your best to hang with me here today. Here's why. We take our self-image into our spiritual journey. 
What I see when I look in the mirror, I tend to project onto my relationship with God. You tend to have a highly scrutinized idea of who you ought to be when you look in the mirror. That's why you don't like what you see. But we tend to project that onto God and assume that God agrees with the scrutiny and our inadequacies. I don't feel good about me, so certainly a holy, all-powerful, omnipotent God can't feel good about me. So I'm here to tell you today that, that what you see and what God sees aren't the same thing. That when you look into the mirror and when God looks into the mirror, he doesn't see what you see. And therefore, he doesn't respond the way that you respond. Becoming a Christian involves radical change. We call it conversion. Everybody who got in that water today has already been converted. They're just telling you, hey, God converted me. I'm a Christian. But if we were going to be very theological about it, we would say they are being recreated. God recreated. They are a new creation in Christ Jesus. And Paul has spent the first part of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 trying to convince us that we are entirely new. It is done. You are seated in heavenly places. You're already there. You're already in heaven. You already have that position. You've already been made new. When God looks at you, he doesn't see what you see. So by the time he comes to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 1, he isn't changing the subject. He's building on the subject. He isn't saying this is everything that you are in Christ. Now get to work and act like it. No, no, no. He's saying that you grow from change, not to change. Okay, that's what I'm afraid you're going to miss today. I'm afraid that you're going to misunderstand that God doesn't call you to change into something that you've never been. He calls you to act like someone who has already been changed. He's not calling you to work hard to accomplish something for his glory. He's saying, I already accomplished it. I'm just hoping that you're going to act like it. Instead of understanding God wants me to do better, my hope is that you can hear, no, no, God already made you better. And when you understand who God made you to be, you can act in accordance with that. God's not calling you to something out there. He's calling you to remember something that he already did. Last week, Pastor Todd did a beautiful job talking to us about a renewed mind. That's what Paul says, a renewed mind. But watch. If your mind isn't renewed, you can't see things correctly. If my mind's not right, my eyesight isn't right. And if my eyesight isn't right, my actions aren't going to be right. So Paul starts with, hey, this is who you are. Think about it. Think like it. Understand it. Let God recreate and renew your mind so that you can see yourself clearly, so that you can do who you were created to be. Paul is going to call out six examples of practical change. And here's my concern. My concern is that for those of you who think, oh, the better me is out there somewhere, that you're going to hear this as a to-do list. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, here's an expression of what Jesus has already accomplished. This isn't about you changing into something. This is about you changing from something. Say amen if you're tracking with me. Again, I want to say to you, don't lose this context. Behavior always follows identity. Before you can walk, you got to sit. Before you can act, you have to receive. Before you can do, you have to understand who you are. This is what Paul is trying to accomplish. By the time Paul comes to Ephesians 4 and verse 1 and says, therefore, he isn't saying, don't, for, don't, don't think about everything that I just said. He's building on top of it. Here's what Jesus has done. Here's who you are. Here's how you live it out. Say amen if you're tracking with me. Amen. Ephesians 4 and verse 25. Therefore, there it is again. Having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. 
Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it might give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit, by whom you are sealed for the day of of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which is out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who has sexually Im- is sexually immoral or impure, or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God in Christ. Let no one deceive you with empty words, but be- for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Six things that Paul is going to say. Because you are changed, act this way. Because you are changed. Not changed to act this way. Because you are changed... This is what a changed person acts like. Number one, because you are changed, tell the truth. Because you're changed, tell the truth. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. That last phrase is so important, because we are members one of another, tell the truth. Fellowship is based on trust, and trust is based on the truth. If we're ever going to be the kind of church that has the type of fellowship that we want to have, that your heart really craves. You don't want to come to church and be anonymous. You don't want to come to church and have nobody know. You want to come to church and be a part of something. But the foundation of that fellowship is trust, and trust only happens where there's truth. So Paul says, because you're changed, tell the truth. Lies undermine the fellowship in the body. Truth strengthens it. Even, watch, even when the truth is ugly, even when the truth's hard to say, masking the truth keeps grace from affecting the truth. You see, whenever I know in truth that I'm struggling, but I come in here and I put on my nice pants, I put on my nice shirt, I put on a little cologne, I dress it all up, I mask up, I come in, hey brother, how are you? How, yeah, 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 awesome. What am I losing? I'm losing the opportunity that God gives me for you to show me grace while I struggle. You come in and you think if they knew, they wouldn't, you fill in the blank. God's saying, no, 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 we already know, but you're masking up and you're keeping us from being able to serve you and bless you and honor you and get our arm around you and walk with you because you don't want to tell the the truth. You can't have fellowship without trust. You can't have trust without truth. Why is, why is this important? It's important because our Redeemer is the way, the truth, and the life. I've been changed by this guy who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, so I have to be a person of the truth. If I'm ever going to walk the way, live the fulfilling life that God wants me to live, I've got to tell the truth. Can I tell you in some of your marriages, stop lying. Stop lying to one another and thinking that it's going to make it better. You say, but if I told her the truth, she would. No, you don't know what God's doing in her life. If I told them the truth, if if I let it come into the light, if I, if I were honest, then, and you've got all these predictions, but you're projecting your self-image onto this body. I know what I would do. I know what I would do if somebody told me, but you've got all that shame and all that condemnation and all the things build up, and you are letting the enemy beat you to death with your dishonesty. If you will just take that authority out of his hands, say, you know what? I'm just going to tell the truth. You strip him of his power, and you invite the opportunity for grace to be offered in your lives. I've told my kids since they were little, if you lie, you are always in trouble. Even if you didn't do anything, you lie about it, you're in trouble now, right? But if you tell the truth, you give mommy and I the opportunity, I don't call her mommy anymore because now they're teenagers, that ain't cool, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) Mom. You give us the opportunity to show you grace. 
But if you lie, if you lie, you get the law. But if you tell the truth, you can get grace. If you tell the truth, you can get grace. Some of y'all, what you're afraid of is the very thing that you're inviting. You're afraid of the harshness. And God says, if you would just tell the truth, you would let the church, you would let me, you would let the Holy Spirit show you grace. You're letting the enemy beat you with shame and condemnation. Tell the truth. Tell the truth. Why? Because you're changed. Because there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. It, be, be, because you're not striving towards something, that's the thing that keeps you stuck. No, no, you're striving from something. You already got it. Sis, you already got it. Just tell the truth. Number two, because you are changed, pursue reconciliation. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Paul is quoting Psalms 4 and verse 4, be angry and do not sin, which lets us know that the Bible permits anger, but restricts anger. Permits, but restricts. The Bible defines anger in two categories, righteous anger and unrighteous anger. And Paul is here saying that unrighteous anger opens the door for the enemy, a door that needs to be shut as quickly as possible. A door that needs to be shut as quickly as possible. Can I, can I pass to you just for a, a quick second? All right. Some of y'all fighting with your spouse for five days is the dumbest thing in the world. I love y'all. Why? Why are you leaving the door and the window and cutting a hole in the roof for the enemy to get into your house just because you're mad? J just because they said the thing. Just because, just because, just because. No, no, don't let the sun go down your anger. Why? It doesn't have anything to do with if they're right or you're wrong or they said or you didn't say. The enemy, Satan, you're giving him, you're handing him a bunch of loaded guns and saying, shoot up my marriage. It's a trip to me. Y'all, no one made y'all get married. No one forced y'all. Y'all, we're in love, right? She's the one. She's my soulmate. And then she says something. You ain't going to talk to her for six days, and you don't think you are sowing, sowing into your marriage bitterness for both of you. That is unrighteous anger. It might have started as righteous anger, but it's unrighteous anger. God tells us, hey, be angry and don't sin because God calls us to love unrighteousness. Let, let me do just say this. I, I could stand to have a little bit more anger in this church. I'll take anger over apathy. I'll take anger over appeasement. I'll take anger over indifference. Listen, I'm here for it. If you're mad about something that you should be mad about, it just lets me know that you're awake and paying attention. Yeah, yeah, there's certain things you should be mad about. Yeah, and at the same time, we need to consider that peacemaking is typically somebody who's willing to break peace in order for the long-term peace. Listen, I'm, I'm willing to fight with you here because I want to be good with you over here. And again, some of us in our relationships, we're just letting the enemy have his way. We, we, just, we aren't paying attention. We get mad, we go days, or we know there's an issue and we won't go to the person that we know there's an issue with. Well, I didn't do anything. That's, scripture says, if you are offended or if you have been offended, in other words, if you know of anything that would be funking this relationship, go, not wait for them to come. Well, they're the one who started it. Again, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Sometimes you have to be willing to break peace. You have to be willing to say, this isn't right. You have to be willing to be frustrated in order to do the thing that's the hard thing to do. So here's three ways, real quick, that you can know if your anger is righteous. Are you all still with me? Yeah. I was angry, but it didn't lead me to sin. Sin doing what? Didn't lead me to gossip. Didn't lead me to slander. Didn't lead me to fantasize about revenge, right? Oh, just... Can't wait to blow up their car and drive it into the river. Yeah. No, whoa, bro, that's unrighteous anger, all right? Yeah, I was angry, but it didn't lead me to sin. Why? 
Because the thing that's going on in you bears fruit, so you should look at the fruit to identify what's really going on in you. Number two, I was angry, but I didn't let it to con- continue or I didn't let it fester. I, I was cautious about resentment, bitterness, or unforgiveness. Can, can I tell you, some of, some of the reason that y'all aren't enjoying church, aren't enjoying God, aren't enjoying, is, is because you have relationships in your life that you are clinging to with an unforgiving spirit. Listen, you want to stop enjoying God, don't forgive the person who's offended you. You want to stop hearing from God, don't, don't, just hang on to resentment. And I know a lot of people who have lost their faith thinking that it was the faith, but it was actually their unforgiveness. Unrighteous anger leads to sin. Unrighteous anger continues past how long? What does Paul say? The end of the day. You say, whew, that's, that's quick. Listen, hear me. Don't, don't misunderstand the difference between forgiveness and restoration, okay? By the end of the day, you're getting forgiven, whether you like it or not. <laughs> that don't mean we're good. That don't mean the issue hadn't, it's been addressed. Paul's not saying you should leave work early and go home and, re-. no, he's saying for, forgive by the end of the day. And if you wake up the next morning and you're still salty, what do you got to do? You got to forgive again before the end of that day. And some of, some of us, we just won't do this. So, so Paul says, listen, you've been changed. You've been changed. Pursue reconciliation. So, so anger that leads to sin, anger that continues, or anger that creates vulnerability in me or us. So when I'm mad... And, it, and, it, and I can tell it's creating something in me or it's creating something, I, I need to be quick. Why? Because righteous anger always craves reconciliation. Hear what I just said? Unrighteous anger is good with division. Righteous anger craves reconciliation. This isn't right. We need to make it right. Why? Why? Because we've been reconciled. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 18, all of this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Watch, Jesus says, I reconciled you and then I make you a reconciler. Number three, because you are changed, value work and generosity. Are you all still with me? A little tedious today, but hang with me. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. Paul is referencing the eighth command in the Ten Commandments. Don't steal, and he takes it further. Not only don't steal, get a job. Come on, somebody, all right? (laughs) So Paul makes work the opposite of theft to let us know that he is including idleness when I should be working as theft. Uh Uh-oh. He, he's, he's including, I'm on Instagram when I should be working at the office as stealing. Right. Not as taking a break. <laughs> I'm on the internet. I got Netflix. I got the masters in the background, all right? No, no, no. Paul says you're stealing. That the opposite of stealing in the Bible is working. But he takes it a step further. He says the gospel makes a burglar a benefactor. This is interesting. Paul says, if somebody, if somebody has stolen, what you need to do is get them a job and give them somebody to give to. If you really want to redeem, and let me just say this. I talk to y'all about this, this church membership thing from time to time, and I say to y'all, some of you think that you're members because you come here and you attend, and I'm glad you're here, okay? Say amen if you understand what I'm saying. I'm glad you're here. But attending doesn't make you a member. A member isn't somebody who comes in and receives. A member is somebody who comes in and receives so they can give. A member, watch, it isn't somebody who signs a document and gives us, you know, whatever information, okay, like we do in a lot of churches. That's not membership. That's roll call. Okay. In the New Testament, membership is I have been changed, I receive from this place, so I'm going to serve. I'm gonna give in this place, and what does Paul say? Some of y'all think you're a part of something that you're actually stealing from. Uh Uh-oh. 
Now listen, if you're in a spot that you're like, look, man, I, I'm, I'm banged up right now, I want you to just come and take and take and take. Hear what I'm saying? Some of you are in a spot where you're hurting, you're, in, you're going through a difficult season, and you should just be coming in and taking. But some of y'all are perfectly fine, and you're still just sitting there. And Paul, and, and I'm a member at Graceway. No, no, no. You're an attender at Graceway. And I'm glad you're an attender, all right? But let's just call it what it, what it is. Let's just call it what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm all up in your business today, aren't I? Whew. Yeah, yeah. This is what the dream team is. What, what does the dream team do? They, they went to growth track today, growth track step two. They got on the dream team, and now they are, they're a part. And they receive and they give so that others can, can receive. Why? Why? Why is this important? Because I have been changed, and I am the recipient of generosity. Philippians 2, Jesus, who was equal with God, made himself of no effect, emptied himself, went to the cross, and made us family. Jesus, who had all of this, had all of this privilege, had all of this worship, had all of this honor, says, I'll set all that aside so they can have. So of course, when I understand what I'm coming from, I'm going to work to bless somebody else. Number four, because you have been changed, use words that build others up. Paul ain't playing any games, all right? If it's moving, it's getting shot today. That, that's what's going on. Flip, uh, Ephesians 4 and verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it might give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Two types of talking, corrupting, and the reference there is of rotten, like rotten fruit, either in, in what's in me that came out of my mouth or what gets created in you because I said it. So a lot of us who say, no, 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 that's not, that's not, I didn't mean for you to take it like that, but that doesn't mean that it's not corrupt because if they did take it like that, then I could have said it differently, better or not at all. So Paul says there's corrupting talk and then there's building up talk and, and there's helpful, cheerful, encouraging, comforting challenging. And the Bible talks about this all over the place. Proverbs 12, some words are like sword thrusts, like I'm, are stabbing. You ever had this? Somebody says something, it's like, oh, wow. Oh, I didn't mean for you to take it like that. Well, I'm still bleeding. <laughs> and then other words are like healing words, like a scalpel. They're, they're said just the right way. Proverbs 18, there are words of life and there are words of death. And those that love them eat the fruit of both. James 3, there are words of fire and there are words of poison. And so what is Paul saying? Hey, y'all, you've been changed. Manage your, manage your heart so you can manage your words. Renew your mind so you see it as it is, so you act based on who God says that you are. But this affects the way that we talk to one another. And some of us, man, we're, we're good-hearted but we don't manage our mouth. And things burn down around us and we damage people around us and we hurt people around us. Listen, I, I can talk about your marriage, I can talk about your relationship to your kids. We get frustrated and we justify, oh, I didn't mean it. Oh, I'm sorry you took that. Oh, no, you shouldn't have said it. Or you shouldn't have said it like that. Or you shouldn't have said it at that time. It, it is corrupting in that it's coming from a place of bitterness or anger, or it's corrupting in that it's created something in the hearer that I have to own because I'm the one who said it. The other kind of person is somebody who says, I'm going to be quiet until I have words that I know build you up. And, and some of our marriages, hey, sh our house should be a little bit more quiet until we figure out to be a little more nice. There are certain things that we just shouldn't say. And it's okay to not say anything until I have something to build up. But why is this important? Because I've been changed and because God's words build us up. Acts 20 and verse 32, now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Listen, if you're reading God's word and you are feeling like God is condemning and angry and always punching at you, can, look at my face, you're reading it wrong. That's not how God talks. Some of us, and I say this to you a lot, I, I want you to, 
Get to a spot where you understand and identify God's voice so that you know when he's talking and when he's not. And some of us, we have attributed things to God that God would never say. God's word builds us up. God's word gives us grace. God's word accomplishes things. in it. God's word doesn't tear us down. God's word doesn't do damage. Fifthly, because you are changed, be kind and be forgiving. Let all bitterness and and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be intimate uh, imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Here's what Paul says. "Put, Put away bitterness, resentment, refusing to reconcile. Wrath, that kind of passionate, raging thing that happens in us. Anger, that more chill, low-key, but I'm, I'm not moving off this. Clamor, that loud, quarrelsome, I'm commenting on Facebook, right? Slander, using my mouth to express my anger in a way that creates division and malice. Some of us, we've just let it fester long enough. Listen, I'm, I'm actually trying to hurt you. I'm actually trying to say the thing. Or if I do hurt you, I don't care. Paul says, let's be done with that. Why? Because you've been changed. Because you've been changed. Instead, be kind. Man, man, what a lost art. Kindness. I, I, I agree with my friend Chris Harper, who says, I think the apologetic for the future isn't academia, it's kindness. What would happen if, every, if you bumped into a person in grace? I don't know what those people believe, but doggone it, they are nice. They are kind. In a world that is so nasty, in a world that's so broken, in a world that's so divided, hey, be kind. Be kind. Be tenderhearted. Keep your heart soft. Don't let your heart get hard toward people or toward ideas or toward places. If you feel your heart getting soft, that's a you problem, not a them problem. And then Forgive. Because you're not going to forgive if your heart is hard, and you're not going to forgive if you can't be nice. Why? Why should I do this? Because you've been changed, because you've been forgiven. What, is, what does Paul say? As God in Christ forgave you, as God is kind to you, be kind. As God is tenderhearted to you, be tenderhearted. As God forgives you, forgive. Imitate it and walk in love. And then sixthly, we are changed. Because you are changed, be pure. Are you all still with me? But sexually immoral and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolishness, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you might be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral and pure, who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Paul says, y'all are changed. So let's not do the sexual sin thing. Okay, so let's name this so we can be clear. Let's not sleep with people who aren't our spouse. Let's not sleep with people that we aren't married to. Let's not look at images that aren't our spouse. Let's not fantasize about images that aren't our spouse. Let's not get into emotional affairs. Let's just, don't, don't even get anywhere near it. Don't let it be named among you. That's what Paul says. Graceway needs to be a place that when somebody says, oh, did you hear about Sally and John? They're having an affair. No, man. They go to Graceway. Ain't no Graceway folks having affairs. That's what Paul says. Can you imagine a church that understands how they are changed, that there are just certain things? Oh, we don't do that. We don't do unforgiveness at Graceway. We don't do affairs at Graceway. We don't do pornography at Graceway. We don't do that. Why? Well, well, because of the cross. And when we do do it, We tell the truth. I did it. Oh, hey, man, let's stop doing that. Thank goodness for grace. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're grateful for you. Let us walk out this restoration with you. So Paul says, rather than indulging in, objectifying, and therefore degrading. Okay, so whenever I make a person an object of sex, I devalue the humanity in them. You got to understand this. You aren't just looking at an image. You're taking the image of God and you're turning the value down as you watch and participate in it just entirely for you. It, it, you're using a human being. Paul also says, not only don't do it, he says don't joke about it. He says it's vulgar. 
He says, don't covet, don't lust for something that isn't yours. Rather, elevate sexuality as something to be thankful for, something that's a blessing, and something that is holy. So here at Graceway, I'm just going to say this. We love sex. Okay, here at Graceway, your pastor loves sex. Y'all are going to act weird about it, all right? No, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for married folk sex. I'm grateful for what it creates in a marriage. I'm grateful for the kids that come from it. I'm, gr- I'm man, hey, it's fantastic. Are you with me? In fact, it's so amazing, I would never joke about it in a way that would devalue how amazing it is. It's so amazing that if you're single in here, trust me when I tell you, it's worth waiting for, all right? Not in a guilty way. I don't need you to get a purity ring and act weird about it, all right? I'm just telling you, it's worth the wait. Come on, married folks, say amen. Yeah, it's worth the wait. And I'm telling you that if you do it before you get married, you're gonna regret it. Baby, you're gonna regret it. You're gonna wish. You're gonna wish. Why, why? Why should I be, be pure? Because I've been made pure. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Yeah. Okay, two things I want to say to you, and I'll be in my seat. Th- this phrase right in the middle, do not grieve the Holy Spirit, I've read that so many times as a good church-going kid and thought, Here, here's how I hear it. Don't make the Holy Spirit mad. Are you with me? Don't do any of these things wrong and therefore make the Holy Spirit mad. But that's not what Paul's saying. Paul isn't referring to grieving the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit going, doggone it, again, Tim? No, no. The word is emotional suffering brought about by bereavement. It's sadness. Now listen, when the, when the Holy Spirit works in Scripture, he says he teaches us, he intercedes for us, he loves us, he comforts us, he calls and he leads us. Nowhere in Scripture does the Bible say the Holy Spirit condemns us, criticizes us, gets exasperated with us. Okay, so this is the tone of a good parent, not an angry judge. If you're a good parent, when you discipline your kids, you don't punish your kids, you discipline your kids. Why? Baby, you're better than this. Honey, this isn't who you are. Honey, this isn't what I want for you. Honey, 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 listen, I need you to stop doing this because here's who you are and here's what God has for you because it's going to be a blessing. And I don't want you to lose out on that. This is breaking my heart to see you keep doing this thing. That's the tone. So here's what, here's what Paul says. You are changed. Here's how you act like it. And when you fail, the Holy Spirit doesn't go, Pfft. the Holy Spirit says, buddy, but baby, 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 we don't do this. Why? Because look at everything Jesus has made you. And, Paul says, the Holy Spirit seals us to the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit says this, baby, we don't do this. Why? Because Jesus made you something better, and I'm going to be with you to the very end to help you get there. You don't get put out. You don't get cast aside. Some of you, you've done the thing enough times, you're like, God's done with me. No, he isn't. God's mad at me. No, he isn't. God has better for you. That's why Jesus went to the cross. And God gave you his Holy Spirit so that it could be walked out, not in your power, but the Holy Spirit's power. So our family has a uh, a Netflix account. Anybody else? Okay. Y'all are flat out leaving me hanging there. I talk about sex, you know what I'm saying? Talk about Netflix. So, So we have accounts... Uh, for each of our family members, and each of those family members has an algorithm, right? So one day I get onto my account, and this movie, The Vow, pops up, all right? This, like, hardcore ladies movie. And I, I call my wife, and I'm like, what's what, what this? Like, I'm trying to watch sports and shoot 'em ups and war movies, and you got The Vow on here with Channing Tatum and Rachel McAdams. <laughs> You're messing up my algorithm, all right? And she's like, well, let's just, let's just watch it. Oh, pfft, okay. All right. So the movie begins um, with this couple that's going to a movie theater. It's in a snowstorm. The woman unbuckles her seatbelt to lean over and kiss her husband. And when she does, a snow truck hits the back of their, their car. They're both sent to the ER because the husband had his seatbelt on. He's good. She 
hit the windshield and has lost all of her memory. Okay? And the movie is of this thing that occurs that you find out that this couple is very happily married, crazy in love with one another, but that the parents weren't in favor of it. So whenever she loses her memory, the parents come in and try to draw her back to her old life because now she doesn't understand her new life. At the very same time, the husband who's crazy in love with her is saying, no, baby, we had a beautiful new life together. I love you. I want to have that life recreated with you. And as you watch the movie, you watch her old life and her, whole, her old identity and the old behaviors that come with it be putting in front of her again and again and again. And can I tell you the experience to have? You're like, no, don't go back to the old stuff. Don't go back to the old life and the old identity and the old behavior. It wasn't that great. You were crazy in love with Channing Tatum. <laughs> don't, 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 don't go back to this other dude. Channing's right over there. He loves you. And you, and you, got, you got Channing who's like, baby, I still love you. And even though you don't remember me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to date you and woo you and draw you and be with you because you had a new life and a new identity and new behaviors that come with. And it was amazing. And as you watch this movie, you watch her go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Can I tell you the experience? It's not anger. It's grief. You're not like, Rachel. What are you doing? You're so stupid. Like, you think God talks to you? You're like, baby, don't. No, 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 no. Channing, Channing, Channing. <laughs> Can I tell you, at, at the, as you watch the movie, you, you, you realize that, that you don't want Rachel, Paige is her name in the movie, to act like somebody in love, like we do in the church. Just, just. Behavior, behavior, behavior. I don't know. You want her to be someone who's in love. Identity, identity, identity. It, and and this, is, this is the message of Paul. Paul is saying that a Christian is somebody who has an old life and an old identity that produces old behaviors. And, it, and it, it wasn't, it's not good. It keeps trying to pull you back, right? It keeps trying to keep you from remembering how good it was and how sweet it is, but you got this new relationship over here. And, and, and God loves you, and you love God, and you have an identity in God that produces certain behaviors. And Paul's saying, remember the change that you're coming from. Remember that you're loved. Remember your identity. Remember that you have the Holy Spirit. And then naturally, it will produce certain behaviors. Don't forget. God is hoping today that you remember that you are loved. God is hoping today that you remember that you love God. God is hoping today that you have firmly implanted in your mind the relationships that you have with God and that they produce certain actions that naturally come out of it. Not because you should, because you want to. Because it's who you are. Because of what Jesus did. Are you with me? God, we love you today. Lots to cover today. But God, my, my hope, something I've been praying about all week is, is just this simple idea, Lord, that we grow from being changed, not toward change. There's, there's nothing for us to go do. There's no shoulds in the Christian life. It, there's the, it's been done. It's been accomplished. Remember who you are. Remember what Jesus did. Remember what Jesus makes you. Remember the relationship and the identity that you have. And natural desires and behaviors will come from that. Lord, we know that there are things that you call us to, things that you want us to be. But Lord, you accomplish those things in our identity at the cross of Calvary. And so I just pray, Lord, I pray that here at Graceway, you would give us a gospel-centered identity. I pray, Lord, that you would remind us who we are. I pray that we wouldn't strive, but that we would know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light, that you give us everything that we need for life and godliness, that it's done. We're seated in heavenly places. But to remember that we're loved and that we love and to act that way. We love you, God. Accomplish these things for your glory and our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give the, word, uh, the Lord a hand of praise for that message this morning. 
you are so incredibly deeply loved by God. And this morning, if you're sitting out here and you're finally beginning to feel what that means, or maybe you're saying, I don't, I don't know if that's really what the case is, and that's the gospel message that you've just heard preached, that God loves you so incredibly much, and his desire is for you to change into who he's already made you to be. So I'm going to ask that we all bow our heads and close our eyes. And this morning, if that's what's on your heart and you're ready to give your life to Christ, you're ready to say, yeah, God, I'm ready for you to make me into who you've already created me to be. Then I want you just to to repeat this simple prayer. You can pray out loud where you're sitting, inside your head, doesn't matter. Pray something like this, Jesus, thank you for creating me and for loving me. Even when I've ignored you and gone my own way, I know I need you in my life. I'm sorry for my sins against you and others. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and you rose again. You are God and I am not. I ask you to forgive me, and as much as I know how, I'm ready to change direction by giving you my life. I'm ready to follow you from now on and do what you want me to do. Please come into my life and make me new on the inside. Help me to grow so I can be like you. If you prayed those words for the first time today, I'm going to ask you to be bold and just raise your hand. That's it. I'm not going to make you come down front. I'm not going to make you come say anything. But just put your hand up in the air and say, that's me. This morning I gave my life to Jesus. One of our ushers is going to come by and they're going to put a Bible in your hand. I've got someone in the back here on my right. Inside of that Bible is a card. You've made one of the most important decisions you'll ever make. What I'd love to have you do is fill that card out, bring it down front, hand it to me, or take it to our next steps desk just as you leave the service. Maybe you said that prayer a couple weeks ago and you just weren't quite sure you were ready to raise your hand. Do that today. We want to come around you and support you in love. Hey, church family, can we celebrate those lives that have been transformed this morning? Come on. That is incredible. All right. Hey, as we're celebrating life transformation, I want you guys to check out these videos to see what else God is doing here at Graceway. so glad you could worship with us this morning. If you're a first time guest, we'd love to learn more about you and pray for you. You'll find a connect card in the seat pocket in front of you, or if you prefer the digital route, you can scan that QR code in the seat back or go to graceway.app and click new here. Now, if you'd like to get more connected to what we're doing here at Graceway, Growth Track is where you can get started. Growth Track is here to help you learn more about God's amazing plan for your life. Step two is about something truly special find friends. We'll be in room 102 at 12 p.m. to explore the beauty of having a community and how it leads to a richer, more meaningful life. Now, for our ladies, save the date for our women's conference on April 26 at 6 p.m. Come for a night of food, music, and inspiration. Register now at graceway.app under The Bridge. I hope you can make it. Lastly, join us for April 28th as we joyfully celebrate 81 years of God's faithful provision at our church. Come and be a part of this special day with us. Well, those are the updates for now. I hope you have an amazing week. In a world that tries to define us by our differences, we are here to celebrate what unites us. We are daughters of the King, bound by a common purpose and a shared faith. At the bridge, we'll dive deep into the scriptures, 
exploring what it means to be Titus II women, women of wisdom like those in Proverbs 14, and virtuous women like those in Proverbs 31. But here's the thing, this isn't just for a few women, it's for all women. Whether you're a young woman figuring out your purpose, a working mom balancing career and family, a single mom navigating life's challenges, a divorced woman finding healing, or an older woman sharing wisdom, you belong here. Because in the kingdom of God, there are no exclusions. He sees our hearts, our strengths, and our potential. Let's come together, learn from each other, and grow. Because when the Holy Spirit empowers women, transformation happens and divisions disappear. You belong. See you at the bridge. All right, ladies, you heard it. Go to the graceway.app and get signed up. for That's going to be an incredible conference. Hey, if you filled out a visitor card or one of the cards in the Bibles, again, you can bring that down front to me or take it to the Next Steps desk. We definitely would love to meet you and encourage you. Uh, don't forget, Growth Track Step 2 is happening right after service. We had a lot of you on Easter say, hey, I got to go to Growth Track. If you didn't get started last week, that's okay. You can start this Sunday morning, it's at noon, so stick around, watch like 15 more baptisms, and then we'll see you at 12 o'clock. If you've got any needs for prayer, and I mean anything, you can feel free uh, to come down. I'm going to have our prayer team make their way down to the front. We would love to have the opportunity to pray with you. Hey, y'all, have an incredible week, and we will see you next Sunday.